juggernaut tank in real world. How is it possible and what will come of it? Today we will examine in detail the history and design of not only the legendary clone turbo tank, but also other little known wheeled and tracked vehicles from Star Wars used by the Galactic Empire. And we will also find out how real such equipment is and how will super heavy armored vehicles look in modern armies of the world. The description contains time codes for each machine. Nordy with you, and we are starting. The Juggernaut A6 all-wheel drive heavy combat vehicle, the largest armored vehicle in the Juggernaut family, occupies a prominent place among the combat vehicles that were in service with the Grand Army of the Republic during the Clone Wars. This wheeled, double-headed giant is one of the most fearsome and massive vehicles used by the Grand Army of the Republic. It should be noted that only the SPHA heavy self-propelled artillery mount was larger in size than this tank. Launched into mass production during the Clone Wars, the A6 model attracted attention for its scale and combat effectiveness. An interesting fact is that the development of this new juggernaut model was carried out by the Kuat company and not by its subsidiary Rothana, which mass produced the famous ATTE walkers and other military equipment used by the Grand Army of the Republic. The Juggernaut A6 had all-wheel drive, a mechanism that ensured its movement using five pairs of wheels. The main difference between the A6 model and the A5 was in the design of the wheels. On the A5 model, the wheels were solid, with a hard coating, maybe rubber, and had a significant width and diameter, providing acceptable cross-country ability with low ground pressure. However, the increase in the size of the armored car in the A6 model led to the fact that solid wheels became ineffective, since even a small obstacle could cause a roll, and even a rollover. To overcome this problem, an innovative wheel was developed, consisting of three independently rotating segments. Each segment could rotate at its own speed and have its own height relative to neighboring segments. This allowed the wheel to adapt to the height of obstacles such as a tree trunk, rock, or spider droid, avoiding them without significantly affecting the armored vehicle. The crew and troops did not feel any obstacles, since there was no noticeable roll. The operation of the Juggernaut was carried out with the tactic of actively using its mass and durable wheels to transform almost all the CIS droids that were in its path into crushed scrap metal. The crews of the Juggernaut armored vehicles enjoyed using this additional weapon during the Clone Wars. As a result of the introduction of new wheels, the creators of the A6 model managed to significantly increase the cross-country ability of their vehicle, surpassing even the Model A5, and noticeably ahead of the cross-country ability of heavy combat walkers such as ATTE or ATAP. The large surface pressure of the witch, caused by the relatively small size of the feet, made them less suitable for movement on soft ground where they could get stuck. In addition, the wheel drive gave the advantage of being able to easily overcome protective fields that were inaccessible to any repulsor technology. Just like on the A5 model, the Juggernaut A6 armored car had two control posts. The developers managed to retain all the advantages of this arrangement, but along with them came the disadvantages, such as possible problems with inconsistency of actions between the driver mechanics in both cabins. In front of the vehicle was the main control post and most of the crew. The movement of the vehicle was controlled by two crew members who could observe the terrain through a viewing slot protected by a thick layer of transparent steel a type of steel from Star Wars used in military equipment, or be guided by sensor data displayed on the screens in front of them. To control the juggernaut and ensure accurate orientation on the ground, a navigator was added, whose workplace was located behind the right driver. This compartment also contained a ladder leading to a roof hatch providing access to a backup observation post. Jedi often held this position during the Clone Wars. The next compartment contained posts for weapon operators, gunners, separated from the control compartment by a durable explosion-proof door. This ensured the safety of the vehicle's combat capability, even when the frontal armor was penetrated. All compartments of the armored vehicle were separated by explosion-proof doors on all three decks. The commander of the juggernaut occupied a spacious turret at the front of the vehicle. Equipped with the same instruments as the driver, the commander reached his post via a vertical staircase leading to the weapons control compartment. Behind the commander under the armored dome were the main sensors of the vehicle and the communications antenna. The A6 armored car probably had the ability to install sensors of various models, which explained the variety of their armor shapes, such as a dome or a flat roof of lower height. Behind the next blast door was a small infirmary, equipped with several beds, medical instruments, supplies of medicine, and Model 21B or IM-6 medical droids. The presence of droids and an extensive supply of medicines made it possible, if necessary, to turn the juggernaut into a mobile medical base. Next in construction was the cargo and passenger compartment, covering the entire central part of the juggernaut. 
This compartment was divided into three decks, connected by several staircases. Apparently, this compartment was modular, which made it possible to quickly convert the vehicle into a cargo version or adapt the space for landing operations. A life support system was built into the walls of the compartment. Also, in this compartment there was a control post for a heavy laser cannon mounted on the roof of the armored vehicle. Under the cargo passenger compartment, there was an engine transmission compartment, which included not only the engine, but also wheel stabilization systems, fuel tanks and a reactor. It is likely that the engine compartment could be accessed through the cargo compartment, preventing the need to leave the vehicle. This compartment was located almost at the level of the armored car wheels, taking into account the armor and protection on all sides with wheels, the engine compartment was the most isolated and protected space in the juggernaut. Placing the engine under the cargo and passenger compartment also provided additional protection for the landing party, which made survival possible even if exposed to a powerful explosion. This feature strengthened the overall security of the juggernaut armored vehicle and improved the safety and survivability of the crew. The troops left the armored car through two wide doors on the sides located between the second and third wheels. Obviously, the location of the doors and the height of the wheels did not allow landing troops on the move. In addition, the opportunity to leave the juggernaut was provided by several hatches in the roof of the cargo passenger compartment. However, this method was inconvenient due to the size of the hatches and the need for a slow descent from the roof of the machine. After all, no one in their right mind, with the possible exception of the Jedi, would dare to jump from a height of 15 meters, and climbing an armored surface under enemy fire was an unpleasant and risky task. From the A5, the enlarged juggernaut borrowed a telescopic retractable turret located directly behind the sensor dome. An observer post is installed on this tower, and the possibility of mounting additional sensors is also provided. The armor and survivability of the juggernaut A6 armored vehicle was truly impressive. The guns of most CIS tanks could only accidentally penetrate its armor, causing minor damage. The A6 crews felt almost no fear of the most numerous separatist tanks, such as the AAT tank or the NRN99 droid tank. Even the IG-227 armed with anti-tank guided missiles could only cause damage to the wheels of the juggernaut, and only with the mass production of missiles had a chance of causing damage to the A6. Grenade launcher droids and other technical means with a smaller caliber were practically ineffective against the juggernaut. However, the juggernaut was not invincible. For the A6, the real threat was the CIS bombers and fighters equipped with bombs, missiles or proton torpedoes. Only two laser cannons on the roof and rear of the vehicle could counter this danger since only they had a sufficient aiming angle. However, these cannons were not designed for anti-aircraft fire and posed less of a threat to the fast droid fighters and droid bombers of the CIS. A significant danger was posed by the fire of large ships located in low orbit or in the stratosphere, since it was almost impossible to disguise such a massive machine. Apparently, vulnerability to air attacks was inherent in the entire Juggernaut series. The only way to deal with this threat was to constantly escort the Juggernauts with self-propelled anti-aircraft guns on the battlefield. Due to their size and weight, the Juggernauts could not be delivered by landing craft of small and medium capacity. This forced the use of only large landing ships like the Acclimator to move them to the battlefield. Now it's worth paying attention weapons and armored vehicle the variety and power of which aroused the admiration of any potential enemy. The main caliber of the Juggernaut were two laser cannons. One of them was located on the roof, and the second was located above the aft control station. These guns had a power superior to most similar guns of CIS armored vehicles by 20%, while not being inferior to them in terms of effective firing range. To counter infantry and light vehicles, the Juggernaut was equipped with two double-barreled rapid-fire blaster cannons mounted on turrets under the forward cockpit, as well as two anti-infantry laser cannons on the sides. This placement of weapons made it possible to create a strong fire curtain in front, capable of suppressing even large infantry detachments. However, this distribution also created a significant dead zone in the aft section. Additional weapons for the armored vehicle were two retractable universal launchers, located on the sides of the vehicle at the level of the second wheel. These launchers could fire guided missiles, effective against armored vehicles and buildings, as well as grenades used to suppress firing points, destroy infantry units, and provide cover during landings. The launchers did not have the ability to rotate, but their design made it possible to fire rockets or grenades both forward and backward. The A6 Juggernaut's combat operations spanned much of the Clone Wars, and they were actively involved in several key battles. Throughout the conflict, Juggernaut's a nightmare for the forces of the Confederacy of Independent Systems, inflicting significant losses in both manpower and equipment. Often it was the Juggernauts that formed the main strike force on the battlefield, 
For example, during the Battle of Kashyyyk that concluded the Clone Wars, the Juggernaut unit became a key part of the forces under the command of Jedi Master Yoda, already at the very beginning of the battle for the planet. Known as the Battle of the Beach in Episode 3, the Juggernauts blocked the advance of the Separatist armored vehicles, and with a bold counterattack drove the droids back into the river. Undoubtedly, if droids had a sense of fear, their reaction to encountering several hundred tons of metal, rushing at a speed of 160 kilometers per hour and emitting missiles, laser beams and plasma bolts in all directions, would be a state of extreme terror. In such a situation, even the most experienced soldier could forget about his military status, weapons and fortified defense lines, mistaking the machine for something apocalyptic. At the end of the Clone Wars, the Juggernauts came under the control of the Empire, in service with the Imperial Army. The Juggernaut A6 was modernized. First of all, the armored car received a new automated control system, which made it possible to reduce the crew by eliminating the second driver and navigator. There is practically no information about the fate of the Juggernaut A6 after the war, probably. Their further fate is similar to the fate of A5, who during the Galactic Civil War took part in the establishment of the Imperial New Order in the Outer Territories, structurally. The A5 model differs from the A6 model in being almost halved in size, length 21.8 meters, height 10 without telescopic tower, the exact width is unknown. The downsizing reduced the number of troop compartment decks from 3 to 2. Naturally, the crew, troops and carrying capacity were also reduced. The caliber of weapons has been slightly reduced, otherwise A5 was just a reduced A6. As noted earlier, the Juggernaut is equipped with two control stations. This is not only justified in the context of military logic, but also represents a kind of reminder of real armored vehicles of the first decades of the 20th century, which were actively used in military conflicts of that time. It should be noted that armored vehicles of that period were characterized by limited maneuverability, a limited turning radius, and low cross-country ability. Therefore, the presence of two control posts was a vital aspect, which ensured the ability to leave the battle zone along the same route that the armored car entered it, while continuing to fire effectively at the enemy. This feature becomes especially significant when the armored vehicle is not equipped with a turret with a circular firing sector. For example, armored vehicles such as the Dutch DAF M39, Polish WZ29, French Lafley AM50, Austrian ADG Zint, as well as many others used a similar arrangement. It should be noted that this organization lasted for a long time. For example, ADGZ transferred to the Wehrmacht after the Anschluss of Austria in March 1938, managed to take part in hostilities on the Eastern Front. The CAVW PX-10 compact assault vehicle wheeled was a high-speed armored vehicle with excellent maneuverability and controllability, which allowed one soldier to operate the firepower of a rifle squad. This machine was created to equip numerous remote Imperial outposts with difficult logistics in the early years of the Empire for the establishment of the New Order. In distant systems belonging to the Empire, including the Outer Rim, many planets were of strategic importance. However, due to their remote location from the centers of Imperial power, maintaining order on these planets and protecting them from various threats was challenging. Pirates, rebels, and even local fauna were potential threats that required a sustainable solution. In response to these challenges, already in the first year of the Empire, in 19 before the Battle of Yavin, the light-armored vehicle CAVW PX-10 was developed and put into large-scale production by order of the Imperial Armed Forces. This vehicle was intended to effectively combat threats on distant planets and ensure Imperial control in these regions. PX-10 was designed with the requirements of remote operations in mind and had a number of features that made it ideal for such environments. Its light armor provided protection against local threats, while maintaining the maneuverability and speed needed for operations in a variety of terrain. Additionally, its weapons were powerful enough to deal with pirates and rebels, as well as any other threats that might be encountered on remote, underdeveloped worlds. The production of the PX-10 in large quantities allowed Imperial forces to deploy these vehicles on many strategically important planets in distant systems. This increased the level of security on these planets, providing protection for both the local population and Imperial interests. Thus, the PX-10 became an important element of the Empire's strategy to maintain control over distant worlds and provide security in regions where it was most needed. All responsibility for operating the PX-10 rested with the pilot, which represented a significant workload, controlling such a powerful machine while simultaneously monitoring its surroundings and operating its weapons was a complex task requiring great concentration and skill. To make this difficult task easier, the PX-10 were equipped with an advanced autopilot. This device made it possible to relieve the pilot, allowing him during the battle to concentrate fully or partially on controlling the weapon. 
At the same time, the autopilot monitored the surrounding environment and carried out basic maneuvers, ensuring the stability and safety of the vehicle. However, despite its innovation, the autopilot sometimes showed insufficient reliability and could fail at times. This created additional challenges for the driver, who was forced to quickly take control of the car in the event of a failure. Despite such technical difficulties, the PX-10 remained a deadly enemy for light infantry on the battlefield. Its high mobility and firepower provided a high level of support to frontline forces, making it an important element of tactical artillery and combat operations. Thus, the PX-10 combined high speed, maneuverability and firepower, making it an important element in the arsenal of combat vehicles to maintain combat effectiveness and safety in combat conditions. The PX-10 armor provided reliable protection against small arms fire of a wide variety of types, be it modern blasters or more primitive kinetic rifles. Its armor provided a high level of protection for the pilot. However, when the PX-10 faced an enemy armed with grenade launchers or light cannons, the situation became more dangerous. In such cases, the pilot had to rely mainly on the maneuverability of his machine and on his skills in evading enemy fire. This tactic could be the only way to survive in such situations. The PX-10 was particularly vulnerable to mines. Even one anti-personnel mine could cause serious damage or completely disable this armored vehicle. This happened especially often on wild planets, where military operations were carried out in conditions of high risk and unpredictability. Units equipped with the PX-10 were widely used by the Empire to provide security for remote colonies, mining complexes, research groups, and to quell local revolts on planets with low levels of development. These armored vehicles provided a high level of mobility and firepower, making them ideal for maintaining order in such regions. Operating experience has confirmed that even small units equipped with PX-10 are capable of effectively controlling large areas. Thanks to their maneuverability and firepower, these armored vehicles could quickly respond to threats and provide security to the population and interests of the Empire in remote areas of the galaxy. However, after the Battle of Endor, where the Empire was faced with a lack of more advanced military equipment, the PX-10 had to be adapted for use against new Republic and Remnant forces. These armored vehicles, previously designed to provide security on planets with a low level of development, have been re-equipped and adapted to perform the role of light tanks in new combat conditions. Thus PX-10, originally known as Colonial Armored Cars, came to play a key role in the Empire's military operations, both in providing security on remote planets and in battles against New Republic and Remnant forces. Their adaptability and effectiveness made them an integral part of the Empire's arsenal in a variety of combat scenarios. During the Galactic Civil Wars and in subsequent decades, PX-10 could be found not only in the traditional gray color typical of Imperial armored vehicles, with the symbol of the Empire, the gear, on board, Despite its military purpose, the PX-10 was not officially considered military equipment, which opened up the possibility for the Nen Carbon Company to produce it for sale on the open market. PX-10 quickly found its buyers. Due to their high maneuverability and decent reliability, these armored vehicles have become popular among reconnaissance and research expeditions operating in the unknown regions of the galaxy. They were indispensable during meetings with native tribes or wild populations on planets. If the locals considered the self-propelled iron cart something hostile, even the thin armor of the PX-10 provided sufficient protection against arrows, spears and stones. Thus, PX-10 was not only a means of providing security and suppressing riots on planets with a low level of development, but also found application for commercial purposes. Its versatility, reliability and ability to provide protection in extreme conditions have made this armored vehicle in demand by the military, researchers, and commercial partners. Sometimes PX-10 were used even on more civilized planets. In the absence of anti-tank weapons and blaster cannons on the opposing side, the PX-10 could be considered a decent tank. This has led to the fact that some security forces of some planetary states began to acquire single-seat armored cars. The PX-10, with its good armor and firepower, could effectively counter opponents without suitable anti-tank weapons. On such planets, where conflicts did not reach a level requiring the use of heavy military equipment, the PX-10 could be a sufficiently strong and fearsome force to maintain order and security. The appearance of single-seat armored cars among the security forces of certain planetary states indicates that the PX-10 has become an important element in their military doctrine and tactics. They provided effective protection and firepower to carry out a variety of missions without the need for massive military operations. 
Thus, the PX-10 has proven its adaptability and versatility, not only on outlandish and little explored planets, but also on more developed and civilized worlds, where it has become an integral part of security and defense forces. During the Galactic Civil Wars, on the basis of the successful PX-10 armored vehicle, some specialized models of equipment were created, one of which was the CAVA-400 Aquadon, which gained the greatest fame. The CAVA-400, or Aquadon, was a significant modification of the successful CAVW PX-10 light armored car, which was in service with the Imperial Army and found use among some local armed forces and research expeditions. The Aquadon project was created to improve functionality and adapt to specific operating conditions. The Aquadon has been specially adapted to work in a variety of conditions, including operation in high humidity, on water surfaces, or in difficult to reach areas. This made her an ideal choice for reconnaissance, security, and exploration missions throughout the galaxy. The Aquadon differed from the base model PX-10 primarily in its ability to move through the aquatic and underwater environment. To achieve this functionality, the vehicle was completely pressurized, the shape of the cabin was changed, and the weapons were replaced. When diving underwater, the Aquadon used only tracks, the rotation of which was ensured by a powerful electric motor at the rear of the vehicle. While retaining the basic concept of one soldier having the power of an infantry squad, the Aquadon was less suited to open combat. To make the vehicle lighter, the armor was weakened, and to increase reliability, a different model of blaster cannon, resistant to water, was installed. However, the power of the new cannon was 20% lower than that of the previous weapon, and the armor became more vulnerable even to easel blasters. Another disadvantage of the Aquadon was the increased cost of operation. However, this circumstance was of little concern to the Imperial government, which had almost limitless resources and a huge military budget. Thus, Aquadon was an improved version of the basic model, specially adapted for operations in the aquatic and underwater environment. While retaining some of the characteristics and concepts of its predecessor, it has become an effective tool for reconnaissance missions and operations in watery terrain. The gyroscopic cockpit of the Aquadon armored car was noticeably reminiscent of the cockpit of a rebel B-wing heavy fighter bomber. In fact, the cabin became the main external difference between the Aquadon and the base model. However, this was not only a cosmetic change. The cabin had the ability to deviate at any angle relative to the direction of movement of the vehicle. This feature greatly facilitated the control of the armored car when moving along the seabed, allowing the crew to better adapt to changing conditions and overcome obstacles. The gyroscopic cabin provided unique maneuvering capabilities, making the Aquadon a powerful and maneuverable aquatic combat vehicle. If the armored car received heavy damage and was unable to move further, the cigar-shaped cabin similar to the rescue capsule of the B-Wing turned into a rescue module. This provided the crew with the opportunity to survive and escape from the battle zone in the event of a critical situation. Thus, the gyroscopic cabin of the Aquadon not only gave the armored car a unique appearance, but also provided significant advantages in maneuverability and survivability on the battlefield, making this modification even more effective and adaptive for performing a variety of missions in the aquatic environment. The first armored cars of the Aquadon model appeared in the arsenal of the Imperial Army around one year after the Battle of Yavin, and soon demonstrated their incredible value in conducting military operations on planets with an abundance of rivers, seas, and oceans. They became a key element in the conquest of such planets, in particular on the planet Cat, where several large rebel cells were located. Aquadon armored cars were deployed in significant numbers. These vehicles, capable of moving both on land and on water, provided the Imperial troops with the necessary advantage in the fight for control of water areas and the coast. Units consisting of at least several hundred Aquadon armored cars demonstrated high efficiency and power, providing support for offensives and holding captured territories. Their ability to maneuver in various water conditions made them an indispensable weapon for combat operations in such difficult to reach places. Thus, the Aquadon armored cars played a significant role in the successful military campaigns of the Imperial Army on planets with water spaces, emphasizing their importance and effectiveness in the struggle for control of galactic resources and territories. However, the basic PX-10 model, like the Aquadon, continued to be actively used by the Imperial remnants until the rebirth of Emperor Palpatine in ten years after the Battle of Endor. During this period, and only in the troops of the reborn Emperor, the CAVW PX-10 began to be replaced by the XR-85 droid tanks. This transition was part of the renewal of weapons and equipment carried out as part of the reforms and strengthening of the military power of the Empire. However, after Palpatine's eventual demise, the PX-10 continued to remain in service with many Imperial remnants.
They may have continued to be produced or were mobilized from reserve to support the war effort. This suggests that even after the fall of Emperor Palpatine and the dramatic events surrounding the Galactic Empire, PX-10 continued to play an important role in military operations and remained a significant part of the military arsenal in many sectors of the galaxy. The Empire of Palpatine's time had virtually unlimited manpower and did not need the use of battle droids. But by the time the Emperor returned in 10 year after Battle of Yavin, the situation was different. The Fragments, which recognized the power of their Emperor, felt a catastrophic shortage of trained personnel and equipment. And if it was not difficult to establish the production of military equipment for the industry controlled by the reborn Emperor, it was almost impossible to find trained tank crews for it. In this situation, it was necessary to use droids and the creation of engineer Umak Leth finally received a start in life. The XR-85 tank itself appeared on the arena of military operations somewhat earlier than the campaign led by the reborn Emperor began. The first XR-85 models began production after the Battle of Yavin and were used to guard remote garrisons and perform combat missions in which it was preferable to minimize human presence. These early XR-85 models were relatively compact and one to two tanks could be carried onto the battlefield even by a standard Guardian-class light cruiser. Subsequently, the XR-85 tanks increased noticeably in size and received significant firepower, comparable to a pair of AT-AT walkers. During the early battles of the Emperor Reborn Company against the New Republic, the XR-85 proved to be an effective weapon. However, some shortcomings also emerged. This mobile bastion turned out to be vulnerable to aviation, especially without proper cover. This drawback was also typical for the first tanks of the XR-85 series. Thus, despite its significant firepower and effectiveness in ground combat, the XR-85 required support and cover to be used effectively on the battlefield. Without the unified centralized rule and defensive needs that accompanied the reign of the reborn Emperor, there was no longer such a high need for the production and use of heavy tanks such as the XR-85. Instead, attention was likely redirected to lighter and more mobile forms of weapons that could be more effective in the new geopolitical environment. Thus, the death of the reborn Emperor marked the end of the XR-85 era, and these powerful tanks likely fell out of production and use during subsequent periods of galactic history. The PX-4 is a mobile command post that plays a key role in the control and surveillance of Imperial Army troops. These vehicles are designed to provide the commander with the necessary communications and decision-making capabilities on the battlefield. The main purpose of the PX-4 is to provide command control over its own troops. Imperial officers use these machines to conduct surveillance, coordinate and issue orders to advancing troops. One of the key features of the PX-4 is its reliable armor and the presence of a protective field generator, which provides the vehicle with the ability to follow advancing troops even in intense combat conditions. In the event of an unfavorable situation, the command post can successfully retreat due to its high speed and mobility. As such, the PX-4 plays an important role in organizing and directing the Imperial Army's combat operations, providing commanders with the necessary tools to make decisions and effectively command troops on the battlefield. The machine has a high-tech communication system based on a complex signal coding system. This system allows for the safe and secure transfer of information between the command post and military units on the battlefield. Thanks to the use of modern encryption methods, the machine ensures the confidentiality of command messages, preventing possible attempts to intercept information by the enemy. In addition, holographic tactical maps are installed on board the vehicle, which allow the commander to have a complete understanding of the current situation on the battlefield. These maps show the tactical situation, the location of your own and enemy forces, and other important details needed to make informed decisions. Additionally, a three-dimensional projector provides the ability to create a three-dimensional model of the combat space, which allows the commander to get a more complete picture of the combat situation. This tool allows officers to better understand the dynamics of battle, identify weaknesses in the enemy, and make effective tactical decisions. Thus, a high-tech communication system, holographic tactical maps, and a 3D projector make the PX-4 not only a command post, but also a control center, providing the commander with a complete and accurate view of the battlefield situation to make informed and effective decisions. The PX-4 has found use not only in the Imperial military, but is also actively used by governors and MOFs as personal transport. These important officials highly value the maneuverability, security and reliability of this vehicle. The PX-4 has become an indispensable means of transportation on planets, with high bandit or insurgent activity where safety and security are a priority. This armored personnel carrier is especially widespread on planets where the risk of attacks are high. Some governors even prefer to travel exclusively with the PX-4. Even in everyday life, 
as they rely on its reliability and protection. This is not surprising, given that the PX-4's armor can withstand even heavy artillery fire, making it a survival vehicle and providing its users with a high level of safety. Thus, the PX-4 has become a symbol of power and reliability for governors and MOFs on planets where security is an important issue. Its high protection, maneuverability and reliability make it an ideal choice for movement in high-risk and threat environments. The laser cannon mounted on the PX-4 transporter, although it has the potential to pose a threat to enemy armored vehicles, is primarily intended for defensive purposes. These weapons provide the armored personnel carrier with the ability to repel attacks and protect against threats, not only from the ground, but also from air or space sources. Although the laser cannon can cause serious damage to the enemy, its main function is to create a defensive zone around the transporter. It is capable of suppressing enemy fire and providing support from air forces or other offensive needs. However, the only drawback of the PX-4 can be its large size. Despite this, these dimensions are a fair price for the high protection this armored personnel carrier provides. Ultimately, its ability to provide safety and reliability in high-threat environments makes the PX-4 an important asset for both militaries and officials on challenging planets. A speed of 200 km per hour for a tracked transporter seems impressive and almost impossible, especially given its large size and weight. However, achieving such high speeds is possible due to several factors, which include innovative technologies and design features of the machine. Ty Mauler, tank from a fighter, the brainchild of a gloomy imperial genius, with the expansion of the empire to various worlds. The need arose for an army capable of providing a military presence in all corners of the galaxy. This led to the search for inexpensive, easy to operate, and cost-effective to operate vehicles for the Imperial Army. The question of vehicles for secondary regions of the galaxy has become especially relevant. A way out of the situation was found quite quickly. To speed up the development and production of tanks, engineers from Santhi Corporation, one of whose subsidiaries created the Thai series of vehicles, turned to their own already existing production of Thai fighters of the first series. This is what allowed the tank to acquire a characteristic and easily recognizable appearance. The main elements borrowed from the Thai fighter were the cockpit and internal layout. The result was a tank that was characterized by extreme simplicity and low production costs. Any soldier could master its controls in just a few hours. This approach allowed the army to quickly and effectively fill equipment shortages in various parts of the galaxy, providing the Empire with a military presence on numerous worlds. The tank's armament demonstrated effectiveness in the fight against enemy infantry, providing one soldier with the firepower of an entire platoon. However, there was a significant drawback in the placement of weapons, similar to what can be seen in fighter aircraft. Fixed guns made it practically impossible to fire while moving, forcing the tank to stop and aim its entire body at the target. An interesting feature of the tank was the presence of a self-destruction system. If necessary, it could be activated to prevent the enemy from capturing the vehicle. In some situations, the tank could even be used as a self-propelled bomb. This meant that it could be brought to an enemy fortification or other target and exploded on the spot. Due to the low cost of such tanks, they could be used in large quantities without significant financial costs. In light of the lack of serious competitors, Wraith Sinar's engineers probably did not see the need to equip the tank with decent armor. It may have been felt that heavy armor capable of withstanding a grenade launcher was overkill for a light tank. Despite the engineers' deliberations, their final product remained the same. The rapid expansion of the Empire and the absence of serious threats seemed to strengthen the Imperials' confidence in their invulnerability. Pirates, heavily armed and widespread during the Republic, were found on every corner in the Outer Rim sectors. However, the Imperials may not have considered them serious opponents, despite the fact that they even had tanks in their arsenal. The tank's thin armor was only able to prevent damage from hand blaster fire. In rare encounters with enemy armor, such as the Rebels, who at the time of the tank's introduction had virtually no armor of their own. The tank had to rely only on its speed, maneuverability, and the fact that reinforcements would arrive before the tank or an entire tank platoon will become only a sad memory recorded in loss reports. The tank known by the nickname Mauler became one of the most dangerous opponents for infantry on the battlefield. Maulers usually operated in a platoon of four to five vehicles, making them a significant force on the battlefield. However, over time, as the Imperial Army and Stormtrooper Corps became saturated with more advanced models of combat vehicles, the need for light-armored vehicles such as the Mauler decreased. This led to the end of Mauler production long before the Battle of Yavin. Previously released Maulers were redistributed and sent to the outer margins of the galaxy, where they likely continued their service in less important sectors, or were retired. Thus, Mauler, despite its formality, gradually gave way to more advanced models of military equipment in the Imperial Army. 
However, the Ty Mahler story is not over yet. More than 10 years after production ended, the project was reborn as a light tank called the Ty Crawler. These tanks were built and used during the reign of the reborn emperor as military conflicts continued throughout the galaxy. The TIE Crawler, having inherited many of the features and characteristics of its predecessor, has become an important element of the army in new military campaigns. It fit perfectly into the tactics of the Imperial Army and proved its effectiveness on the battlefield. Thus, the TIE Mauler reborn as the TIE Crawler continued its service, demonstrating the viability and adaptability of the technology to changing conditions and the requirements of military strategy. During the reign of Emperor Palpatine, the Imperial forces were at the height of their power and did not experience a shortage of new high-quality equipment, as well as factories for its production. However, after the Endor disaster, the situation began to change. Each year, the Imperial Remnant's production capacity was further reduced, posing a threat to the Imperial military might. Five years after the Endor disaster, only a few Imperial military leaders could afford the production of modern military equipment. This led to the need to revise the strategy and develop more affordable weapons options. In such unfavorable realities, the idea of creating a mass-produced light tank has become relevant again. It had to be cheap to produce, easy to operate and maintain, in order to provide the Empire with the necessary military superiority in the face of limited resources and production capabilities. The development process for the new vehicle was carried out with an eye on the TIE Mauler light tank project, which was released shortly after the end of the Clone Wars. The new machine, called the TIE Crawler, inherited some of the features of its space ancestor. From the space progenitor, TIE Mauler, Crawler retained the cockpit structure and the principle of installing two laser guns. The guns on the tank were also adopted without changes. The pilot controlled the machine using pedals and two handles that resembled a fighter's steering wheel. The pedals controlled the speed and direction of movement, while the handles were used to aim the weapon and fire. This design provided the pilot with comfortable and efficient control of the vehicle, while retaining elements typical of TIE fighters, and ensuring continuity in design and functionality across the Imperial Army. Ten years after the Battle of Yavin, these tanks were mass-produced for the army of the reborn Emperor and some Imperial remnants. After the final death of the Emperor, production of the TIE Crawler continued, although in much smaller quantities. During the Vong invasion and the Second Galactic Civil War, a number of these tanks were still in service with the remnants. There are two known fully equipped TIE Crawler units, the 88th Mechanized Assault Group and the 71st Elite Mechanized Assault Group. Both of these units took an active part in the fighting of the last years of the Imperial Civil War, from 4 to 11 years after Yavin. Despite declining production and outdated designs, the TIE Crawler continued to play a significant role on the battlefield, providing Imperial forces with maneuverability and firepower during military conflicts. Probably prior to the outbreak of the Second Galactic Civil War, production of the TIE Crawler resumed between 40-41 years. This is indicated by the presence of these tanks in service with Corsac, the Corellian Security Force. The presence of the TIE Crawler in the arsenal of Corellia, one of the leading systems in the galaxy, indicates a renewed interest in this tank model. It is possible that updated versions or improved modifications were developed to meet changing security and defense needs in the period leading up to the Civil War. This may also indicate that TIE crawlers were found to be an effective means of providing security and control during the heightened tensions and instability that characterized the pre-war period. The TIE crawler inherited both the advantages and disadvantages of its predecessor. Among the latter, it should be noted the low-mounted guns, which made it difficult to fire on rough terrain and completely excluded shooting from cover. This factor significantly limited the tank's capabilities in tactical scenarios where it was necessary to use the terrain to its advantage. The second significant drawback was the very low combat survivability of the tank. The thin armor of the vehicle could be penetrated even by standard blasters, and anti-tank grenade launchers completely deprived tankers of any chance of survival. This limited the use of the TIE Crawler in conditions of intense combat, where the vehicle was subjected to heavy fire pressure. As calculations show, this tank was useful only in combat situations in open areas against a weakly armed and small enemy. In such conditions, its maneuverability and firepower could be most effective. However, in scenarios where urban combat predominated or there was a strong anti-tank threat, the TIE Crawler's advantages were significantly reduced. First, let's look at how realistic the juggernaut of the A5 model is, since structurally it is a smaller copy of the A6. Therefore, A5 may be more realistic. Then let's look at other machines. So the very idea of building a 20-meter multi-ton wheeled vehicle is quite realistic. For example, the Belarusian Bella's dump truck is very similar in size to the Juggernaut A5, 
Theoretically, it is quite possible to build a huge 10-wheeled car, but let's look at the specifics of a tank of this size and this structure. Drive and suspension play a key role in the maneuverability of a wheeled tank. In the case of the Juggernaut, its drive is expected to provide high speed and excellent maneuverability thanks to its wheelbase. However, we are faced with the problem of maneuverability on uneven terrain. Suspension also plays an important role in cushioning shock and vibration, ensuring crew comfort and system integrity within the armored hull. Traditional tracks provide better maneuverability in difficult conditions such as mountains or forests, allowing the tank to overcome obstacles and remain stable even on uneven surfaces. Wheels can quickly encounter difficulties when overcoming uneven surfaces, which will reduce cross-country ability and therefore limit the scope of application. Of course, in such a huge machine as the Juggernaut, whose wheel diameter is more than 3 meters, various small obstacles like a wall or a fallen tree, ditches or trenches or even a small building, will be insignificant, and making a 20-meter vehicle on a tracked chassis is much more difficult. So the Juggernaut wheelbase is the most optimal solution. But there is another problem. For a 20-meter tank, you still need to find the appropriate terrain that is some kind of road at least 10 meters wide. Armor is one of the most important aspects of the implementation of a wheeled tank like the Juggernaut. In the fantasy world of Star Wars, A6 armor is considered impressive capable of withstanding attacks from most enemy tanks. However, when we translate this concept into reality, we face challenges. The use of traditional armor materials, such as composites or armored steel, involves significant weight, which can affect the maneuverability and overall efficiency of the tank. New high strength, Low-weight composite materials may need to be developed to maintain a balance between armor and maneuverability. This in turn will require very powerful engines. In addition, the degree of armor must take into account modern threats, such as anti-tank missiles and other modern weapons. This highlights the importance of using advanced armor technologies, such as reactive explosive defenses or active missile defense systems. So while the Juggernaut's armor may be inspiring, the reality is that it requires significant engineering and science to create the optimal combination of strength, weight, and advanced protective technology. In general, for such massive and expensive models of equipment, the best armoring option both in the real world and in fictional universes would be power shields. In the case of Star Wars, deflector ones for protection against energy weapons, and corpuscular ones for protection against shots from mass driver guns, that is, physical metal projectiles, creating a protective force field similar to those we see in science fiction films and books. In particular in Star Wars, there are two main types. The aforementioned deflector and particle shields seems extremely difficult and is currently not feasible within the framework of our existing technological level and scientific knowledge. First, to create a force shield, it is necessary to develop ideal materials capable of generating and maintaining such a field. These materials must have unique physical properties, such as the ability to create powerful magnetic or electromagnetic fields, safety for the environment and human health, as well as stability and durability. Secondly, it is necessary to develop efficient and safe energy sources to power such fields. Maintaining a force field requires significant amounts of energy, and these sources must not only be powerful, but also sustainable and environmentally friendly. In addition, creating a protective force field requires an understanding of the physical laws and principles that underlie it. To date, we have only a basic understanding of these principles, and even the most advanced technologies in the field of magnetic and electromagnetic fields are far from creating such large-scale and complex systems. After all, when we talk about creating a protective force field, we refer to the idea of a zone that can reflect absorb or divert various types of threats or impacts, for example, laser beams, physical objects, energy explosions, etc. Creating such protection requires deep understanding of physical laws and principles, as well as technologies that can implement these concepts. In theory, magnetic fields could be used to deflect or change the trajectory of charged particles such as bullets or laser beams. Creating a force field based on electromagnetic fields requires the development of means to generate extremely strong magnetic fields and control them in real time. Also ideal materials for creating a protective force field should be able to reflect or absorb various types of energy, such as light waves or physical objects. This may require the development of composite materials with unique optical and mechanical properties. At the same time, maintaining the force field requires significant amounts of energy. Such systems must be able to efficiently convert energy from power sources into the necessary types of energy to create and maintain the field. Most importantly, creating and maintaining a protective force field also requires the development of effective command and control systems. This includes developing algorithms to monitor the environment and respond to threats in real time. 
In addition, it is not clear how the force field will allow air to pass through without allowing other objects to pass through. How will it interact with environmental objects? Will it be able to let people through, etc.? So although the concept of a protective force field may seem attractive and exciting, today, the creation of such a system seems extremely difficult and unattainable due to the huge number of technical and scientific problems that need to be overcome. And the creation of a protective force field is more of an object of scientific fantasy than real technology. However, with the development of science and technology in the future, perhaps we will be able to come closer to the implementation of this concept. And then juggernauts and other massive equipment may be the best option for installing protective force field generators on us, since such systems will most likely take up a lot of space. Space, which is available in abundance on wheeled and tracked giants. Naturally, the most unrealistic aspect of the juggernaut from Star Wars, not counting the force field, which is still not used on it, is its weapons. If laser weapons, albeit very weakly, are still being developed by humanity, then blasters that shoot plasma remain complete fantasy. In reality, the Juggernaut would most likely be equipped with one or two, or maybe even three full-fledged turrets with main battery guns. The design of the tank makes it possible to place several turrets on it. Also, the Juggernaut could be equipped with numerous machine guns and small-caliber autocannons and special unmanned modules, and several missile launchers. High development of artificial intelligence would greatly simplify the task of coordinating fire from all guns for a tank commander. For that matter, you can make the controls similar to various game simulators. And the like, when the weapon operator only gives priority to targets and gives the order to open fire, and the AI independently captures the target, makes calculations, and so on. Regarding the nuclear reactor installed inside the Juggernaut, everything is not so clear here. On the one hand, we have the technology of small nuclear power plants, which if refined could fit into a Juggernaut. The A6 model for sure, but the need for such a reactor is questionable. If the Juggernaut uses combustible fuel, which is most likely, then the need for a reactor will completely disappear. The main thing is to make spacious fuel tanks. If the earthly Juggernaut is driven by an electric motor, then a large number of batteries and accumulators can be placed inside the tank. In any case, the Juggernaut is unlikely to need a full-fledged reactor, and the price of the tank may increase greatly, and the damage to the environment in the event of a tank explosion may be unacceptable. The concept of using the Juggernaut in modern combat is a very interesting question. On the one hand, Juggernauts can break through enemy fortified areas very well due to their ability to carry heavy weapons. Also, the appearance of the Juggernaut can greatly distract the enemy's attention, which gives the allied forces room for action. With good armor and high speed, Juggernauts can successfully distract attention and maintain combat effectiveness, while the rest of the troops win. On the other hand, the enemy's heavy artillery and missile weapons pose a very serious danger to the Juggernaut, since it will not be difficult to hit such a target. And the price of using a heavy missile justifies the defeat of the expensive Juggernaut, and the Juggernaut will most likely cost a lot. Also in the concept of modern network-centric warfare, there may be no place for such a wheeled giant as the Juggernaut. In the real world, it would be much more expedient to make a heavy self-propelled artillery gun, or even a vehicle for launching tactical and strategic missiles on the basis of a juggernaut. The result would be something vaguely reminiscent of the MIM-104 Patriot, or Topol M. In this case, the scope of use of the juggernaut would be similar to heavy missile systems for tactical or strategic purposes. As for the A6 model, here all the problems are exaggerated, and implementation into reality becomes much more complicated. And in the case of an artillery system, it would be difficult to find missiles that would be large enough to be installed on such giants. What about other technology? The PX-4 command and control vehicle, while similar in size to the A5 Juggernaut, has the same disadvantages, which are exacerbated by the tracked chassis. And again, there is no clear use for it. But the CAVW PX-10, being actually a light tank, is an almost real and even quite functional military vehicle in the real world. With the exception of the energy cannon, which can be replaced with large caliber firearms, or even a minigun, this tank is quite real and even very promising. In the modern world, when expensive heavy tanks are destroyed by pickup trucks with grenade launchers, cheap, and at the same time protected from light and even heavy small arms and shrapnel, while being able to carry tank weapons with dozens of missiles, thereby representing the firepower of more than just an infantry squad, and even a whole platoon, can become extremely useful on the battlefield. Actively developing AI as in Star Wars will allow the crew to be reduced to one pilot. Making a vehicle completely robotic and unmanned, like the XR-85 droid tank, is a questionable decision. The AI lacks creative thinking, and either acts in a patterned and predictable manner, or is so unpredictable that it poses a danger even to allied forces. Effective and safe use of AI is only possible with a live operator. The best option seems to be a platoon-level unit, consisting of one commanded vehicle, and several, 
from three to eight robotic tanks, which receive important commands from the platoon command vehicle. In this way, creative human thinking is combined with unexpected and even sophisticated tactics, and the cold-blooded execution of AI tasks, while minimizing possible losses among personnel. The relevance of the CAVA-400 amphibian is difficult to assess, since it is not entirely clear how such a vehicle will be used. The most interesting way could be to use it as a sabotage vehicle, to attacks from unexpected directions, as well as as a civilian research vehicle, a kind of tracked analog of a bathyscaphe. As a result, the advanced states of the planet can create a 20-meter 10-wheeled tank similar to the Juggernaut without any problems. But the question of the need for such a combat vehicle remains open. But light-tracked manned and robotic tanks can become very relevant in modern armies of the world. In any case, write what you think about this in the comments. And see you in new videos.